Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you now, Lord, and we open up our hearts and our minds to you. Lord, may we hunger and thirst for your word. May we be people of your word, Lord, that continues to shape us and mold us to become more like your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray once again that you would give us ears to hear. That we would discern your Holy Spirit's leading. And that we would be obedient and faithful to follow. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Will you stand with me this morning? We are continuing our journey into Matthew's Gospel. Last week, we arrived at the very center of Matthew's Gospel with the beheading of John the Baptist. This morning, we find ourselves in the 15th chapter. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open up to chapter 15, starting in verse 10, going to verse 20. If you have your tablets or your phones, you open them to Matthew 15, verse 10 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, Adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But what you eat with unwashed hands does not defile. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, we're going to get there. You may be seated. You know, last week I set you up for that, and I totally forgot to say it at the end, so I did this week. I caught you by surprise, but uh, again, we're going to close the reading of the Word with, this is the Word of God for the people of God, and your response is, thanks be to God. Well, uh, this week has been a series of parenting wins for us uh, in our house. Uh, We had two of our boys lose some teeth, uh, and the fairy forgot to come. (laughs) <laughs> you would think after one time we would learn our lessons, but no, middle child happened to lose one of his, and unfortunately the, the fairy forgot to come. Uh, and so what that means in our house is the fairy brings double the next night, so uh, I'm going to immediately go after this and sell my kidney uh, to, to afford that, because not only are they losing teeth now by the droves, but uh, they've developed that hollow leg syndrome to where I think food just goes down there. Uh, and it just, it just does not, like, exit at all, and, and they're just, they eat all the time. Uh, so pray for me. Um, well, as we had mentioned last week, we're beginning a new section in Matthew's Gospel. At the end of chapter 13, Jesus is rejected in his hometown, and, and that begins a series that, uh, of opposition and miracles that's going to run all the way to the end of 17. And so there are going to be some people, some groups of people here in, in the last few verses of chapter 13 all the way to 17 who are going to come and they're going to oppose Jesus. But then there are going to be others who are going to come and they're going to seek healing. We're going to face opposition and miracles. And that's going to be the theme for uh, Matthew's gospel until we get into chapter 18 and that's when things start to get a little bit more serious. 
Well, last week, if you'll recall, uh, and if, by the way, you ever forget a message, you can always go online at bfcn.org and, and, and look under the media tab, and there you're going to find uh, all of the previous messages that I preach or Pastor Kyle preach or Dwight or somebody else preaches, and I want to encourage you to go on there. You can also go on to iTunes or Google Play and uh, you know, subscribe to the podcast uh, if you want to do that. Selfish plug there. Uh, that way you could take me wherever it is that you want to go. Uh, I can join you on a walk, uh, if you would like, or on a jog, or as you're working out. Uh, and so I want to encourage you to do that if you ever miss a message. But last week, we ended with the end of John's earthly ministry, that, that fateful, tragic party uh, where Herodias and daughter, you know, plotted John the Baptist's demise. And at the end, we are told that, that Jesus was told this news by John's disciples. And what Jesus does right after that is his, he decides to withdraw to a, a place where he could be alone. Well, the problem is, is that people notice this. And so as Jesus got into the boat to go to another part uh, on the Sea of Galilee, this crowd follows along. And when he, when he comes ashore, the crowd's there. And that's when we get the, the miracle of the feeding of 5,000. Uh, and, and that miraculous, uh, beautiful story in Matthew's gospel. Well, then shortly after that, Jesus still hasn't had that chance to be alone, to, to grieve the loss of his friend. And so he sends the disciples on ahead and says, listen, you go by boat. I'm going to stay back. I need to be alone. And then he's alone. And of course, uh, it's at night. He's walking on the sea. The disciples see this, right? And, and they think that they're seeing a ghost. And eventually, Peter, the spokesman, spokesperson for the disciples, you know, he says, listen, if it is you, Lord, you know, call, us, call me out and I'm going to come, right? And so uh, he goes out and he, he's the only one besides Jesus to walk on water, except he walks on water for just a, a, a few brief seconds because he sees, you know, the chaotic water. He gets afraid. He starts to sink. Jesus pulls him up gets in the boat with them, and then they make their way to Gennesaret. And then when they land on the shore there, a crowd quickly forms. And this crowd is coming, uh, bringing people who are diseased, sick, and Jesus heals them. Well, then we come into chapter 15, and, and we are told uh, at the very beginning, in fact, our verses 10 through uh, 20 are, are really the latter half of this story in Matthew's gospel. For Matthew uh, in, in chapter 15 says that Pharisees and scribes, they've come from Jerusalem. Now, that coming from Jerusalem heightens the conflict and the tension in this text. There was a period of time when, after I graduated from college, I worked for Home Depot. And the Home Depot that we worked for uh, was going through some internal conflict. And there was a lot of uh, turnover happening with employees, department heads were upset with assistant managers, assistant managers were upset with them, manager is upset with them, district managers getting upset at the manager, and it was just turning really ugly uh, and getting very stressful. Well, one particular day in our kind of uh, group meeting before the store opens, we were informed that somebody from Atlanta was going to be coming to, to meet with us. Now, for those of you who know anything about Home Depot, Atlanta is headquarters for Home Depot. And so when we heard that term, especially those department heads and managers, uh, there was that heightened tension because somebody from corporate is going to come and, and, and fix this mess. And so Pharisees, they're coming from Jerusalem, the center of the religious world. And they're confronting Jesus. And, and the question that they have for Jesus is why aren't he and his disciples uh, adhering to this tradition of the elders. Why is it that they don't wash their hands before they eat? Now, the problem with that is that Scripture is extremely silent about this whole hand-washing thing, except for priests. And, and, and the problem is, is that the Pharisees, they, they believed uh, very strictly in, in, in the Torah and the Mosaic written law, but they also believed that God was communicating and had communicated to Moses orally, giving him some commandments. And so they had come up with this idea of the tradition of the elders. And, and what was taking place here, and, and what they uh, don't fully realize, Jesus knew Scripture better than them. Right, Because what Scripture might be silent on with hand-washing, Scripture speaks loudly and clearly about this whole idea of honoring our parents. And so a tradition, ancient tradition that was taking place back then was this idea of korban, which was this concept of 
dedicating all of your resources and your riches to God so that if you declared that practice, that means you didn't have to take care of your aging parents. And in a patriarchal society, that was not a great thing to do. But a lot of people were doing that. And so the Pharisees, they were creating these oral traditions. Except they, the problem was is that they were twisting the law. And, and Jesus saw through this, right? And, and if you'll kind of look back uh, into the first few verses of that chapter, he goes on to call them, you hypocrites, right? To, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, this crowd that had gathered to be healed by Jesus, Jesus, in, in our text this morning, he addresses the crowd and he says, listen and understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth that makes you unclean. Now, I understand that many of us, we've been a part of the church for a rather lengthy period of time. And what I'm about to tell you, I want you to hear very, very clearly because this could be misconstrued. In the Nazarene church, we have a lot in common with the Pharisees. Now, if the DS is listening, please listen carefully. Any general as well. You see, the Pharisees, they they took very seriously this charge to be a holy people. We do that. Leviticus 19.2 says, Be holy. For I, the Lord, your God, am holy. In the Nazarene church, I want you to understand, we take that charge very seriously. To be a holy people. Just like the Pharisees. Are you still with me? Okay, four of you are. Good. Well, we also are very passionate about the word. Guess who was equally as passionate about the word? Pharisees. Remember that whole idea of strict adherence to the Torah? When you do those things, when you take this charge seriously to be a holy people. And by the way, I want you to understand that when I say that, in the Nazarene church, we we are radically optimistic about God's grace. We believe that, that God can change a person now. It's a good place to say amen. We believe that wholeheartedly, that it's not just for the by and by, but that this radical transformation through the power of the Holy Spirit can occur in our lives now, that we can become changed people, holy people, and that we are equally as passionate about the Word. In fact, if you've ever sat and endured, by the way, uh, a membership class of mine, uh, you will hear me often say, you know, things like, we take seriously this idea of of Scripture, that everything that we believe, it's grounded in Scripture as Nazarenes. And when you do those things, it can sometimes make us a bit odd, like the Pharisees. Because one of the things that I used to hear growing up, it was a common refrain, is that you don't go out with, you don't drink, smoke, and chew, and go out with the girls that do. Oral tradition. Are you with me yet? Are you with me? See, we have, we have the word. We have this charge to be holy people. But then sometimes in the Nazarene church, we are as guilty of creating these oral traditions. Traditions of the elders. That we're told that we can't have too many tattoos. I couldn't go to a movie until 1995, and I had to go do that in Florida. I had to go away from Oklahoma City to go watch a movie because my parents were afraid that we might be seen at a movie theater. I didn't go to my first dance until I was a senior in high school because we were told that you couldn't do those things because those things were going to defile us. Those things were going to make us unclean. And yet, I've known many churches who've had board members 
who are having affairs. And we would turn a blind eye to that. But if somebody came into the church who looked different than us, that was a problem. It's not what goes into our mouths that defile us. It's what comes out of our mouths that makes us unclean. Now, I don't know if I've lost you yet or not. And and, and you young folks, I want you to hear this very clearly. What I am not saying this morning is that practices aren't important. I believe that they shape us. I believe that they continue to form us. To become a holy people. But sometimes we have masked that with the things that we don't do. The things that we don't say. And we have forgotten that it's actually the heart that makes us clean or unclean. It's the heart that determines whether or not we are a holy person or not. And if you get mad at me, I'm sorry, get mad at Jesus. You see, he talked about this not only here in chapter 15, but he talks about it in the Sermon on the Mount. You see, the whole idea of adultery back then was like, it was a, whole, it was a purely physical thing, right? But Jesus turns that up on its head and says, listen, no, no, if you even just look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery. You see, what the Pharisees got wrong, and sometimes what we in the Nazarene church get wrong, and by the way, I love the Nazarene church. I was literally birthed in a pew in the Nazarene church. I'm going to stay a Nazarene my entire life because I think it's the doctrine that this world needs, this idea of this radical optimism of grace. That God can change people's lives here and now. If I didn't believe that, I certainly wouldn't be pastoring. Are you with me, church, this morning? You see, it's what comes out of us that makes us unclean. It's the things that our hearts reflect on. It's the things that our hearts devise that makes us unclean. Because you see, the heart, according back then, and I still think it is today, it's the center of our consciousness. It's where commitments are made. It's where our values lie. It's where our ethics come from. And long before before Freud and other psychologists came along, Jesus had these wise words to say. Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. It is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Because What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. Now, how are our hearts this morning? It is so easy for us in a world where we have privatized faith to come on a Sunday morning and to mask ourselves. How are our hearts this morning? What are they revealing about us? What things might need to change in our hearts in order for us to become a holy people? Will you stand with me this morning? I realize it's quiet. I'm just going to assume that's the Spirit speaking. It's not about what we don't do that makes us a holy people. What makes us holy is our commitment to Christ and learning to love God our Father, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. 
It's not the things that you touch that make us unclean. It's what comes out of our mouth that makes us unclean. How are our hearts this morning? You know, I've struggled all week with this message. Because it it dawned on me on on Wednesday of this week how pharisaical I have been for most of my life. i got to be honest, there was a point in this week where I was making some notes and journaling to myself. I kind of like the Pharisees sometimes. They get a bad rap. I think their intentions were good. I mean, they, they wanted... God's Messiah to come. They, they wanted to, to rid Israel of, of the paganism, you know, and Roman imperialism that was there. And they felt like in order to do that, they had to strictly adhere to the Torah. They need to get everybody else on board, right? I mean, week in and week out, we're charging, whether it's myself or Pastor Kyle, the Sunday school teachers, be a holy people. Live lives that are different. And sometimes when I'm saying those things, I'm thinking, that's just like a Pharisee. Because I'm telling you to not do certain things, not go to certain places. But it's our hearts that matter. So how are our hearts this morning? Are they where they need to be? Or do they need to be cleansed? That's between you and God. I want to invite you to to close your eyes, bow your heads. We're going to sing just one song, Whiter Than Snow. And if the Spirit is speaking to you, we're just going to go one time through. I want to invite you to come this morning. We're not going to drag it out, but I want to offer you a chance this morning to come and pray. As Rick and the praise team leads us, I want to open us up in a word of prayer. And after they sing just one stanza and one chorus, we'll close. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I pray this morning that we would allow your Holy Spirit to inspect our hearts. That we would be faithful and obedient to follow. Maybe there's a matter that we have left unresolved that we just need to give to you this morning. Lord, may we we give it back to you. Father, give us the courage to follow faithfully this morning as we sing, Whiter Than Snow.